This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Hey everybody, so my brain recently broke and I no longer know how to write uh, videos anymore. This is my way of telling you that today we're going to be having a chill little time where I talk about MatPat videos. So MatPat is a kind of internet juggernaut. He has three separate, extremely successful YouTube channels. The Food Theorists, The Game Theorists, and The Film Theorists. And as the names would imply, his videos generally center on wacky theories he has about art. Today, we're going to be talking about a few of his film theories that I personally think aren't very good. And uh, that's it. That's what's going to happen right now. Woo! <laughs> hey, just one quick disclaimer. I was watching back some of the footage for this video, and it's just, it's just so mean. It just feels so mean. Some parts of it, like, it's brutal about MatPat videos. You'll see. You'll see what I mean soon. Uh, but I just wanted to say up top, MatPat. I don't hate, I don't hate you. I don't hate Mad Pat. You know, I'm very passionate about media criticism. I'm very passionate about talking about interpretations of art, but I don't, I don't hate, I don't hate you, Mad Pat. In fact, I kind of respect you. I think it's cool that you do, you know, interpretation for kids. I just don't think all of it's done very well. Um, but it's not personal. This isn't a hit piece on Mad Pat. Onto the video. Enjoy it. Have fun. Bye. So, for our first subject, I want to talk about Matt Pat's work on the film Us. There once was a movie that was highly anticipated by audiences. For those who don't know, Us is an interesting movie about a bunch of doppelgangers called The Tethered who come from a tunnel system under the United States. And the film follows a family trying to survive their tethered's coming to the surface to kill them. For the most part, Matt Pat's video is all right. He devotes almost the entire thing to the notion that the movie is about the failure of consumerism and the American dream. Materialism is the shield. It's the solution because it's always the solution in America. And that's fair enough. It's a good point, and he makes it competently. The real problem for me comes right at the end of the video. See, in the conclusion of Us, it's revealed that actually, the protagonist of the movie, Adelaide, the person we've been following this whole time, is actually a tethered. When she was a kid, she switched places with the surface version, now called Red, and lived as a human. And Matt interprets these events in the following way. The point isn't that there's this big twist and whoa, Adelaide isn't who she thought she was and it completely changes everything we saw before. The whole point is that for the entire movie, we couldn't tell the difference and neither could anyone else around her. I mean, think about that. Our society is so shallow and vapid and surface level that an entire person got replaced by a copy, a clone, a science experiment that the movie explicitly tells us has no soul and no one skipped a beat. No one could tell the difference. So uh, this has got to be one of the worst takes I've ever seen. So let's start with the facts. First, People could tell the difference between Adelaide and Red. After they switched places, Adelaide, the former tethered, couldn't speak for years. Her parents took her to a psychologist because they thought she had been traumatized. I just want my little girl back. I mean, obviously her husband and children can't tell that Adelaide is a tethered because that's the only version of her that they've ever met, uh, but that just seems like an unfair standard to hold them against. I don't know. The second and far bigger problem here is that the tethereds have souls. Like, he puts this really strong emphasis on the film telling us that the tethered don't have souls. A science experiment that the movie explicitly tells us has no soul. But sadly, the opposite is the case. I believe they figured out how to make a copy of the body, but not the soul. The soul remains one, shared by two. They created the tethered. As Red says, they are two bodies that share one soul. He's just wrong here. He's factually wrong about us. So what's going on here? Why is MatPat doing so poorly on this point? Well, obviously I don't know what's going on inside the guy's head, but I will say that his misinterpretation here is necessary if he wants to maintain the very facile, liberal, defanged understanding of us that he has. 
From his perspective, it seems, Us is a very straightforward movie. It is about how the American dream is flawed, and flawed specifically because consumerism is a snake eating its own tail, and we will never be sated no matter how much we consume. And you can go through Us plausibly thinking that that's the only thing the movie is trying to say, until the ending. See, the ending of Us is revelatory and exceptional, and that's for the exact opposite reason from the one MatPat said. Because after finding out that Adelaide began her life as a tethered, you sit for a second and realize it doesn't matter. Not because we're so shallow that we can't tell, but because these two people, Adelaide and Red, are actually the same, one person in two bodies. And whoever got to live on top, whoever was forced into the tunnels, it makes no difference at all. The entire structure of oppression at play here is arbitrary. This is the final image of the movie, all the tethered stepping out of their tunnels and holding hands. They are not villains, they are not the bad versions. As Red says at the very beginning of the film, We're Americans. And they're just like, literally exactly like, us. But see, MatPat here just kind of chooses an angle and goes with that come hell or high water. Us is a quite politically radical and thought-provoking film. It is, at its core, about class, about who owns what and why. But to hear him talk about it, it's just a moralistic ramble about how we shouldn't be buying so much dumb stuff and the actual facts of the movie have to shift to accompany that interpretation. But hey, that's just a theory, a film theory. I'm gonna be saying that at the end of every video of his I talk about. You can say a lot of things about MatPat, but him ending every video by saying, that's just a theory, a film theory, is fucking iconic. I love it so goddamn much. So let's move on and talk about what is probably the strangest film theorist video that I've seen. His take on the 2012 Dr. Seuss adaptation, The Lorax. How mad will you be? It's time to do a film theory. The basic argument that MatPat wants to make here is that the so-called villains, Aloysius O'Hare and the Onceler, are in fact not villainous at all. And he goes to some interesting places to make that case. The first subject of the video is Mr. O'Hare. For those who are unfortunate enough to have not seen the absolute bop that is the 2012 Lorax, O'Hare is an added character. After the forest was destroyed by the Onesler, creating a shortage of oxygen, O'Hare started a town, Thneedville, where he provides air to people in some ambiguous way. And MadPat wants to argue that this guy is good, actually. At the end of the movie, when we look out over the ruined wasteland, it's important to understand that isn't what O'Hare created. It's what he had to overcome for his company and town to be successful. And he did it. The people are happy. As we see in the opening song of the movie, his consumers are clearly thriving. So this is what I would call the best point in this video. Lorax 2012 is an extremely weird movie. I made a video about it myself, and one of the weirdest things about it is Aloysius O'Hare. See, we want to look at this guy and say that he represents the worst deprivations of capitalism. He sells people air, and if they don't buy it, they'll die, I guess. But within the universe of the movie, this just doesn't feel true. Thneedville slaps. Everybody there is constantly vibing and having a good time. And so, MatPat is kind of right. The film doesn't give us very good narrative tools to understand O'Hare as a bad guy. That said, I think MatPat does go a bit far smelling this guy's farts, right? Like, he's so weirdly dismissive of everything bad he does. Sure, he doesn't want to grow the tree at the end of the movie, but outside of that, he took a desolate, polluted wasteland and turned it into a consumerist utopia where everyone is happy. O'Hare is a lying propagandist. He actively destroys distributes misinformation about trees to maintain an artificial monopoly on oxygen production. He tries to make the world more polluted. The more smog in the sky, <laughs> 
the more people will buy. And he uses violence in order to maintain his status quo. This is important for later on, by the way, so just keep it in mind. Regardless of the mixed messaging in the Lorax, O'Hare is clearly a bad guy in a lot of ways, and MatPat just kind of dismisses that. So after talking about Aloysius, MatPat moves on to a discussion of the Onesler and how he's good, actually. And it's just so ridiculous. His basic argument is that the Onesler is just a nice entrepreneur who went his own way, and so you can't be mad at him. Onesler wasn't wrong. His product is something that everyone wants. The Thneed is the world-changing product that he thought it was. I'm sorry, I just can't fault a hardworking guy with a dream who overcomes adversity to achieve tremendous success as the bad guy in this case. I sincerely don't know how to respond to this point because, like, what is he even talking about? The Onesler cut down an entire forest to become the world's richest man. He made vast swaths of the world unlivable because there's no oxygen left. He made the Lorax and all of the forest creatures leave their homes. How is that not bad? How is that not a bad thing? You know, I, I don't know about his personality. He seems like a cool little, little twink man, uh, but he does a lot of things that are wrong, I think. Okay, so now things start to get more interesting. See, after MatPat finishes his strange Onesler O'Hare apologia, he asks a question. If these boys aren't the villains, then who is? And the answer he gives here is just so great. Who is the villain of the Lorax? It's the consumer. It's us. It's easy to point at the big business guys, in this case the Onesler and Aloysius O'Hare, and say, you did this. You're the one at fault for all of this. But they're only doing what we as the consumer are telling them to do. It's us. It's the consumer. So this take, just on the face of it, makes no sense. Like, if MatPat thinks neither the Onesler nor nor O'Hare did anything wrong, then how could it be wrong or villainous to buy their products? You can't say, this man is a great innovator who is just responding to demand, and then say, the consumers are evil little dumb boys and I hate them. You can't have it both ways, you know? The most charitable thing we could possibly say is that they're both responsible for these events happening. But what I really can't get over about this point is that Lorax 2012, this incoherent mess of a movie that says nothing nothing clearly, is actually able to deliver a more incisive and mature critique of capitalism than MatPat is seemingly able to understand. Remember when I was talking about the shitty things Aloysius O'Hare does in the movie? Yeah, that's really relevant here. Because the thing is, within the world of Thneedville, consumers cannot simply vote with their dollars to attain the outcomes they want. Demand here is produced by the supplier. Aloysius lies and uses violence in the name of profit, and while consumers may have a choice in buying bottled air, they clearly do not have a choice in buying air, which is what Aloysius spends the entire movie making sure of. MatPat correctly calls the Needville a corporatocracy. He even makes a big deal out of the idea of such a thing existing. The Needville is basically a corporatocracy, a word that sounds like it was made up in a Dr. Seuss book, but nope, it's it's uh, actually right here in the dictionary, because truth is more ridiculous than fiction sometimes. And so it is telling how naturally he identifies that corporatocracy as secretly democratic. How quickly he will produce defense of the owner, the ruler, and blame the consumer, the subject. Anyway, there's just one last part of the video I want to talk about. At the very end of the video, MatPat reaffirms his point about consumers and says this. And if we disapprove of the way someone is doing business or what a company stands for, it's up to the consumer to vote with their dollar. But to both O'Hare and Onceler in the movie, the dollars thus far had been telling them, we approve what you're doing. That's why this line in the movie and in the book is so important. Because unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, Nothing is going to get better. It's not about the Onceler. It's not about O'Hare. It's about us. And that is the message of the Lorax. One that I think most people, and especially Illumination Entertainment, completely miss. Hmm. You know... Sure, the original Lorax and its 22-minute adaptation were perhaps a bit more subtle and thoughtful than this new one. The Onesler doesn't have a face there. He's not a big bad villain. He's just a guy who could be any guy. He is power and industry, and he is interacting with an incentive structure that pre-exists him. So yes, the Lorax 2012 misses something here. It's not a good movie. But honestly, the idea that the message of the original 
Lorax that is being missed in this new adaptation is vote with your wallet is just so mind-blowing to me. You know, when the Onceler says to the kid, Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. Why would you assume he's directing the kid mainly to consume better things? The Lorax is about the devastation of nature, and it's about a person who tries to protect it, even if he doesn't really have the power to do so. And this is just my personal opinion, I guess, but I take Seuss here as saying that we have to be like that. Work together and actively fight against those incentive structures that do grave harm. Advocate in all the ways we can for a world that cannot advocate for itself. Speak for the trees, you know? To make the message as simple as vote with your dollar, it's just such a lifeless read of the work, I think. Like, why would you make the choice to have this interpretation? I don't get it. It haunts me a little bit. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. Okay, I want to move on here and talk about another MatPat video that I kind of just have a nitpick about, but which I nonetheless am going to explore for the next, like, 10 minutes. His work on Ratatouille. Ratatouille is a Pixar movie about a little rat, Remy, who loves to cook. I'm sure you've seen it. And the thesis of this film theory video is simple. That in fact, Remy is the bad guy in Ratatouille. And if you look at his on-screen behavior, you'll realize that he's not actually the good guy here. And in the broad strokes, this is just fine and silly. You know, Remy pushes Linguini to kiss some lady against his will. He kidnaps somebody with his rat friends. It's just stuff that's like, Wow, if Remy really did that stuff IRL, people would be rightly mad with that rat. I don't know, it's, it's fine, it's whatever. But no, the thing I want to focus on here is a point toward the beginning of the video. As MatPat says, part of the reason why Remy is bad is that he steals and does so knowing that it's wrong. The first thing Remy did that put a bad taste in my mouth was establish himself as a habitual thief. Now that alone wouldn't be too big of a problem. The real issue is that he lies about it. Towards the end of the movie, he lets the entire rat colony have at it. In any realistic context, this is absolutely disgusting. Not to mention that restaurants operate on razor-thin margins for their product, so stealing the food here might literally put them out of business. So I find this point here very interesting, and it is my channel, so let's talk about it. To start off, stealing as a concept is extraordinarily important within the world of Ratatouille. It is strangely one of the film's key fixations, particularly when it comes to Remy's character arc. The fact that Remy steals and that it is bad comes up around four times in the movie. At the beginning, when Remy is stealing trash with his family, We're thieves, Dad. And what we're stealing is, let's face it, Garbage. When Remy first goes to Gusteau's, a fancy French restaurant, wants to eat some food and is told off by his own conscience. I, I don't know where I am and I don't know when I'll find food again. Remy, you are better than that. You are a cook. A cook makes a thief. Thanks. When Remy prepares an omelet and is told by Linguini that he doesn't need to steal. Look, it's delicious, but don't steal. And at the end, in the all is lost moment, when Remy allows his rat family to pilfer Gusteau's restaurant, and we're directed to understand this as very bad and selfish. So yeah, it is important. The movie wants us to know that Remy steals and that stealing is awful. A chef makes, a thief takes. So what do we make of all this? Do we think it makes Remy bad? Uh, well, I don't. I disagree with the movie. You know, rats in Ratatouille are not given moral consideration by the human world. The characters who see them shoot them on sight, chase after them, treat them like we sometimes treat rats in the real world. And that's fine, that makes sense, but it does lead to a kind of problem. Remy is here bound by a moral structure that he is not a subject within. Remy's right to life is not honored, yet the right of humans to their bits of food are somehow sacrosanct. It's puzzling, and we have to ask, is it wrong to steal food when you're very hungry from a group of people who are hostile to your very existence and would definitely kill you if they had the chance? And no, of course it's not. You gotta do what you gotta do. 
to stay alive, right? Rumpy should steal as much as he and his family need and not feel bad about it at all, as far as I'm concerned. Moreover, this no-stealing policy, as strange as it is, isn't even applied coherently. In one notable scene, Remy is talking to Linguini when he eyes some cheese and this happens. Oh, you're hungry. Okay. You know, Linguini doesn't own that cheese, at least not to his knowledge, and so if it is wrong to steal, as the movie constantly indicates it is, then we'd expect this scene to implicitly judge Linguini's actions here. But it doesn't. It's a nice scene. Linguini is framed as an altruist. So how do we understand this? Uh, well, I think it's fairly simple, right? Rats in this movie are a kind of underclass whose every action in human society is a deviant one. They cannot take food for themselves in order to live. Rather, they must be given food by kindly humans. This is kind of an aside, but this whole stealing thing really produces a deep contradiction within the ideology of Ratatouille. On one hand, Ratatouille is about the importance of talent. It is about how the marginal members of society can be great if we only give them a chance and not judge them so quickly. On the other hand, Ratatouille is about how the actions of the marginalized, as brilliant as they may be, are only virtuous and legitimate when they appease a set of moral structures invented by the powerful and deployed on the powerless. Remy can be a great chef, but only if he doesn't challenge the arbitrary and cruel ethics of his masters. So no, I disagree with Matt Pat here. I don't think it's fair to understand Remy's theft or his feelings of guilt over it as morally compromising at all. But I also think this point is interesting beyond my disagreement with it. Before, when we were talking about the Lorax, there was a sense that the film theorist is more of a contrarian than anything else. Obviously, the Wunstler and O'Hare are supposed to be bad, and so there's a kind of joy in saying that they're good, regardless of whether or not that's true. The same applies to this Ratatouille video. We don't think of Remy as the villain, and yet, as MatPat claims, he is. But in this moment of the video, what we find is something very different, a kind of wholesale and uncritical acceptance of the film. Ratatouille wants us to think Remy is a bad guy when he steals. The movie in no small part surrounds this thesis. And yet, in this case, that conclusion encounters no resistance whatsoever. It's just left there with some silly explanation about how restaurants work on slim margins. He's just making Pixar's case more for some reason. I don't know. I think it's an interesting moment. Uh, but hey, that's just a theory. That's just a film theory. Don't say... Big Joel, you were wrong about this. It's just a fucking theory. <laughs> okay, let's move on to one last video. A bit of work Matt Pat did on the show Rick and Morty. Matt's done a few videos on R&M, actually, but today I want to focus on one where he tries to argue that the fifth season of the show is actually about the origin of Evil Morty. I think that what we're witnessing in season five is Evil Morty's origin story. Things feel off because we're following a different Morty and Rick from a different point of their lives. I'm not going to explain who Evil Morty is. I feel like it would take too long. But the point is, MatPat is saying that we're following a different Rick and Morty this season, not the pair we've been seeing all along. So to be honest, I kind of think this theory is cute. It would be a fun reveal to find out these boys aren't the ones we thought they were. The theory never made much sense for a variety of reasons, and recently the season 5 finale came out and definitively proved it wrong, but still, I don't have a problem with it. The thing I do take issue with, though, is some of the evidence he used uses to support this claim. Like, one point he makes is that Morty changed a lot between seasons 1 through 4 and season 5. Throughout his entire emotional arc, the way he deals with infatuation, lust, love, and falling out of love feels immature compared to where we saw Morty last season. In case you forgot, back in the season 4 episode Vat of Acid, the show's creators low-key slid an amazing 4-minute silent film right into the middle of the episode. By the end of the episode, his maturity level has skyrocketed. You know, it was fun, Rick. Living without consequences is great, but then I started wondering, what am I living for? Compare that to the level of emotional development and maturity he displays at the start of this episode. Over. I don't want to think! I want to see a girl I like! 
And this is used as evidence that maybe he's just a different Morty. So I could say a few things about this, but I'll leave it at one point. MatPat is acting like Morty is this extremely fixed character who always behaves in ways consistent with what you might expect from him, but this is not the case. Morty is a pretty elastic character, particularly in season 5. For example, in the first episode of season 5, Morty, without actually needing to for any good reason, goes into a portal and kills a bunch of dog people, mostly because they pissed him off. Hey Narnia, let's go! Let's fucking go! <laughs> This speaks to a character who is pretty apathetic about life and who is slowly adopting his grandfather's position that nothing really matters all that much. Cut to two episodes later, where Morty is dating a hot eco-terrorist who kills a bunch of coal miners because what they're doing is bad for the environment. And he's all like, This is the only way I can save Earth. The only way I can save you. If that's the only way, I, I don't want to be saved. Please go. Don't, don't be killing all those people, you know, it's not right. Uh, that's my, uh, you know, get out of here. I, I can't be with you. Justin, Justin, if you ever don't want to be Morty, I'll take it. I'll take it from there. So which is it, Morty? Do you love to massacre thousands of randos when a few individuals kind of cross you? Or are you super invested in the value and dignity of life? Well, it's neither, or it's both, right? Morty is a bag of contradictions, and it doesn't make sense to act like him being mad at his mom is some huge, out-of-character moment for him. It just isn't. But the much more notable and strange point that MatPat makes is that, like Morty, Rick's character has shifted a lot. And this is his only example of that. We watch as Rick in the episode falls in love with an alien. Okay, Grandpa, the meteor is almost here. We can go now. Ah, uh, nah, we still got time. Then stop being in love and start having fun. Oh, love's pretty fun, Summer. Just give it a chance. This is totally out of character, considering that back in season one, he was the one telling his grandkids... What people call love is just a chemical reaction that compels animals to breed. Focus on science. MatPat uses this to argue that this Rick is not the one we were following in the first season. So this point isn't just silly, it also feels like it's attacking the very concept of paying attention to shows. This contradiction in Rick's character is not evidence of some break in continuity. No, it's literally what the entire show is about. Rick is a cynical, myopic man who stares down the barrel of an incomprehensible universe and embraces the notion that nothing matters. Yet he also craves love and connection and cares about the people in his life, even if that doesn't totally make sense to him. But leaving aside this broad thing about the themes of Rick and Morty, MatPat's point just doesn't make sense here because Rick loving this random alien just isn't all that weird or anomalous for his character. Like, at one point, Matt says this. Falling in lust? Yeah, that's a total Rick move. But wanting to make an emotional connection with someone and then being furious when the relationship ends? Yeah, that that's not our Rick. And he says it while showing footage of the season 2 episode, Autoerotic Assimilation. But he seems to forget that after this person, Unity, breaks up with him, he goes off off and tries to kill himself. You know, it's not just lust. It seems like that relationship was pretty meaningful to him. More meaningful, in fact, than the one he has with this rando. Oh, love's pretty fun, Summer. Just give it a chance. It's just, it's, it's such a bad point. Like, this guy has made around a dozen videos about Rick and Morty. How could he say this? I don't, I don't understand. Like, does he not watch the show? Does he not watch the show? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I'm fucking losing my brain cells. But hey, that's just a theory, a film theory. You know, I imagine I'm going to be seeing one comment a lot in my comment section. Big Joel, you'll say. You don't get it. MadPat's channel is just, like, fun. It's whimsical and silly and basically made for kids. It just seems like you're taking this a bit too seriously. And you know what? I actually think this is a pretty reasonable comment. MadPat's channel does tend to surround a kind of joke. Like, look at one of his videos about The Lion King, for instance, which claims that in real 
life, a lion with Scar's appearance would be far more attractive than one who looks like Mufasa. According to research done at the University of Minnesota, don't you know, lions with dark manes are actually much more attractive to female lions than those with lighter manes. And that on that basis, Scar is the rightful king of Pride Rock. Now, I could disagree with this video, but to do so would be missing the point. MatPat knows that real lion mating habits, no matter how accurately he describes them, will never actually be relevant to the plot or themes of the movie. This entire video is just using the Lion King as a prop to be entertaining and teach kids a thing or two about lions. This sort of thing is a lot of the channel, and I don't really have any issue with it at all. But sometimes, as we've seen today, MatPat wants to do something more or different. When he is interacting with Rick and Morty, he is saying something about that show's plot and its characters. When he talks about Ratatouille or the Lorax, he's talking about the moral universes of these films. And his Us video, well, that's just what I do, looking at art and trying to figure out what it's about. Whether he likes it or not, MatPat is sometimes a film critic. He's interested in how media works and in what it says. And I think it's interesting that even then, the movies still just kind of feel like props. More takes about Ratatouille. You talked about Ratatouille for a while in this video, but I crave and yearn for more. If you're one of the eight people shouting that at the screen right now, chanting it with me, more Ratatouille, please, then I'm excited to tell you about Nebula. Every month for the foreseeable future, I'll be releasing a little bonus video there. I have a bunch up there now that I'll flash on the screen, and this month I talk about a line from Ratatouille whose treatment by the film has always confused and almost disturbed me. These vids can be released to the public after a long time, usually like a year, but most of them probably won't be, since they're not always going to be algorithm friendly, friendly, friendly or something I'd want to release on the main channel for whatever reason. If you like my videos, boom! Go watch them. If you hate my videos, get out of here! Don't even worry about it then. The whole thing is pretty nifty, with a subscription to Curiosity Stream where you can watch great nature documentaries like this one about owls. You also get access to Nebula, where you get my videos early, those bonus ones, and access to tons of other stuff. Work from Sarah Z, Lindsay Ellis, Tom Scott, and probably other people. I don't know what's going on. For $15, you get access to the whole thing for a year, so not too bad. Anyhow, if you're interested, sign up at the link in the description, curiositystream.com slash Big Joel. So that's it. That's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it enough. I thought it was pretty fun to make, so I, I hope you enjoyed it too. Um, if you did like it, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, give me money on Patreon if you want to. You get those bonus videos too, the ones I have for Nebula, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Dr. Discord asks, are you or have you ever been religious? I went to Hebrew school for a few years as a kid, but I very quickly realized that I did not believe in God. I wasn't bar mitzvahed. I was too much of a little shit lord for that, so I didn't do any of the things, and I never loved God, and I never loved Jesus. Bye.